Well, you know, people in the world, they reach the apex of their lives or careers by some events that are life-changing. For example, an athlete might think that the highlight of his career is winning a race where he has a, a trophy he can put on his mantle and when people come over he can show them saying, you know, I won the race, came in first and, you know, have got bragging rights in this area. If most people are asked what was the highlight of their lives, a lot of them will tell you that it was the day they got married. To them, that's the highlight of their life. Another person might think a big promotion at work was the highlight of their life. Or, for us, most of us think of the highlight of our life was the day we got baptized. The day that we went into that water and came out as a you know, begotten Son of God, we received God's Holy Spirit, and that is a special day. Consider that the highlight of our lives. People have different perspectives on life and also what they consider the most important in their lives. But what about us, brethren? I'd like to turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, and we'll read verses 13 to 18. 1 Thess Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> In verse 13 it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. So Paul was admonishing the brethren there. First of all, don't be ignorant. In other words, be cognizant of the fact of what's going to happen here. And concerning those that are, have died, lest you sorrow and have no hope. And in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who slept in Jesus. So he's telling, don't worry about those who have died because when Christ returns, those people are going to be brought back and they'll be with Christ. And in verse 15, So this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, we won't be ahead of those, but it'll just be a fraction of a second in time, really. We won't be ahead of the ones that have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. So it's not going to be an event that is hidden in a corner. I mean, when you think of the children of Israel, when they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, and the trumpets, it says the trumpets were blowing louder and louder and louder. I mean, they said, Moses, you talk to God. I mean, you know, this is kind of scary for us. So when the trumpet of God sounds, it'll be audible. And it's amazing that a trumpet, if you think of any musical instrument that you could stand on a hill and play, a trumpet would be the one that you could hear the furthest. It just carries the sound really far. I mean, if you stood on a hill and played a violin, I mean, you know, might be able to hear it for 100 feet or so, but a trumpet, it really carries the sound. And I think, you know, there's a reason why God is gonna blow the trumpet when Christ returns. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them on the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall also be with the Lord. So that's the promise that we shall always be with God, you know, when Christ returns. And therefore, comfort one another with these words. And these words are comfortable when you think of it. They're very comfortable that when Christ returns, we go to meet him and we are in the kingdom of God. So really, this event is the highlight of our lives when we change from physical to spiritual. The flesh, by nature, breaks down from the moment of its inception. As soon as you get something or make something new, it starts to break down, including the earth and the universe, which we know is going to be replaced with a new Jerusalem and a new earth. Spirit, on the other hand, is designed to last. It doesn't break down. It doesn't wear out. It can be around for eternity. <clears throat> Notice verse 18, it says, take comfort in these words. Though there is comfort in these words, that when we are transformed from physical to spirit, we're gonna be around for eternity. And that's very comfortable. Because most of us have some kind of physical problem. 
We don't have perfect health. As you get older, things break down. You lose your hair. You don't have, I don't have all my teeth. <laughs> your memory starts to go, and that's the annoying part about getting older. I mean, I'm starting to forget things. Honey, what did I, I go out in the yard to work, and I put my gloves down, and five minutes later, I'm walking around like, where did I put my gloves? And it's so frustrating. You know, oh, there they are, right where I left them last. And my wife will tell me too sometimes, honey, I've lost something. I says, well, you didn't really lose it. It's where you left it the last time. You just can't remember where that is. <laughs> but that's, that's the joy, yeah, the joy of getting old. But getting old is not for wimps, really. It isn't because, you know, the longer you're in the flesh, the more things have a tendency to break down. So I'd like to uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, discuss some of the issues here in 1 Corinthians 15. And... Uh, I'm going to read verses 50 to 58. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaking here, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to go into God's kingdom as flesh and blood. It just doesn't happen that way. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. It's just incompatible. We are corruptible as in the flesh. As spirit beings, we're incorruptible. And in verse 51, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, not everyone will be dead when Christ returns, but we shall all be changed. Those alive and those that are dead are going to be changed from physical to spirit. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. So here again, talking about the last trumpet. And the transition is quick. I mean, it's like in a twinkling of an eye. So you may be physical one second and a fraction of a second in your spirit but I mean you probably feel the same <laughs> did, did I change something happened here uh, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible so just like when Christ was raised he was raised incorruptible as a you know spirit God being we shall be changed also and in verse 53 for this corruptible must put on incorruption that's a must We've got to transition to the spirit, into the kingdom. And this mortal, which we are today, must put on immortality. So then, so when, I'm sorry, verse 54, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And that's so true because there will not be any more death as far as we're concerned in the first resurrection. We're going to be living forever, eternity. And in verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. In other words, the end result of sin, unrepented of, is death. And the strength of sin is the law. So the law defines sin. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, stand firm, in other words, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. So our, our work, our labor, our dedication to the work, our zeal is not in vain, brethren. There's a humongous, tremendous reward coming in the future. You know, personally, you know, I'm, I'm happiest when I'm doing something, you know, when I'm building, eh? Like, if I'm working, I get, a, I get really impatient if my wife calls me, come and eat. No, I'm busy. I want to finish this project. And, and that's just the way I am. You get so involved in what you're doing, you, you want to put off eating. You just want to get the job done. Because, you know, it, it's challenging and it's fulfilling. In the kingdom... You will not face such frustrations because you don't have to take a break. In other words, you don't have to eat. You don't have to interrupt the project, which is going to be really neat. You don't have to sleep to regenerate. You can keep focused on the job at hand. You don't have to, you won't run out of steam. I notice as I'm getting older and Dilly and I are working in the backyard. I mean, we used to be able to go out there and, and, and work for six, seven hours without even taking a break. 
Now we're out there in the summertime in a boat, an hour after, honey, time to take a break. So we have to sit down and take a little breather. And it's frustrating because your mind says, I can do this. Your body says, you better take a break. You better take a break. Time to slow down. And it's, it's just so different compared to when we moved to our house 21 years ago. I mean, you had all the energy in the world. Now we have a limited amount of energy. There are many uh, challenges and opportunities in the millennium. And today I want to examine a few. And, and the title of my uh, sermonette is Challenges and Opportunities. When Christ returns, uh, we're, we're not going to be living in paradise at the beginning. This world have, will have gone through probably, well, it will be, the worst times in human history. I want to cover a few of the, before going into this, some of the things that, conditions in the sense leading up to what I want to talk about. The first one I want to discuss is over in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, and uh, verse 22, this is Christ speaking, and he says, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. I mean, that's a pretty scary, in a sense, statement, isn't it? If it weren't for the elect, no flesh would be saved. Now, that's both human and animal flesh. There wouldn't be anything flesh living on the earth if those days were not shortened. And you can imagine the praise that the church members turn into the God family will receive from those living in the millennium physically when they realize that it's because of us that they're there in the first place. Because if we would, you know, if we weren't fulfilling our responsibilities and we were not the elect, there wouldn't be anybody left alive. So, is God a just God by having us go through that? Is, is there something wrong, you know, to punish man and, and the earth in this way? Well, let's look at Jeremiah 32 for a minute and just we'll analyze some of the things that have gone on historically to get a better understanding why conditions in the world are going to reach such an apex, you might say. Over in Jeremiah 32, I mean, God is not a mean God trying to punish man because he enjoys punishing human beings. But over in Jeremiah 30, the chapter 32 and verse 35, referring to the nation of Israel, it says, and they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnon, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Moloch, which I did not command them, nor did it, nor did it come to my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. In other words, their sin was so bad, God it didn't even enter his mind that they would do such a thing. I mean, just think, I mean, from his point of view, his men and willing to sacrifice their own children to a pagan god. I mean, he didn't ask them to do that to a pagan god. He didn't ask them to sacrifice their children to himself. And he said they didn't even come to mind. It was so abominable. He never even thought that they could ever do that. That's how shocking and abominable that things were in Israel. I mean, you know, the sin was just unbelievable in God's eyes. And the whole problem about what's going to happen to this earth is just a result of sin, the consequences of sin. Let's go over to Genesis 6, brethren. I mean, people, they live lives in total sin, and they just think, well, you know, there's no consequences for, the, for sin, but there is a consequences, and sometimes the consequences for sin, other than the fact that sin leads to death, is very, very detrimental. Over in um, Genesis 6, and beginning in verse 12, it says, So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Now you think about this for a brethren. Think about this brethren for a minute. 
God is saying, Christ was saying at the time, we know he's the God of the Old Testament, that not only were men corrupt, but all flesh. So what does that tell you? That indicates to me that there was some form of bestiality and, and corruptness with flesh animals. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made that statement. I mean, that that's how bad things were. And it didn't take that long from a historical point of view to reach that stage. And, he, and what did he do? He had to dis, I mean, he didn't try to save any of this. He just destroyed the whole works, except for Noah and his family. And it's like starting over again, a fresh start. But I mean, under Satan's influence, it didn't take long to reach that point in history, did it? To the point where God has to eliminate all of flesh, including animals, and start over again. It's just unbelievable. And over in Genesis 19, another example here, <clears throat> in regards to Sodom and Gomorrah, in Genesis 19, and uh, verse 4 and 5, it says, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Come, I'm sorry, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Now when you read that, it's kind of written in a, a way that you don't get a full idea of what they're really saying. But the, the International Standard Version says, so that we can have sex with them. That's basically what they want. They were, and, and the appalling part is, it says young and old, all of them. So it was like everybody in... in and that town was perverted. I mean, sexually perverted. I mean, to the point where what? Did God try to work with them to have them repent? No. He pulled Lot out and his wife and two daughters and destroyed them. That was the only solution. So it reaches a point where you're so corrupt and so perverted and so twisted in a physical sense that God has to kill you and then bring you up in a different environment and then offer you salvation then. Let's turn over to Revelation 9 for just to give you the mindset of people. You know, and this is after a lot of things have happened in Revelation 9. It's not like at the before the tribulation even starts. In Revelation 9, in verse 20, it says, But the rest of mankind who, did, who were not killed by these plagues, and the plagues are covered in the previous chapters, they did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons. So even after all this time, they were still worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver. I mean... You'd think that at one point, you know, after all, going through all the plagues, that uh, they would wake up and think, well, maybe we're doing something wrong here. You know, it's like a, a man banging his head against the wall and he says, well, that really hurts every time I do it. But, you know, if you stop doing it, it won't hurt so much. And uh, uh, idols of stone, silver, and brass, stones uh, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, because they're not God, only they're just idols. And in verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders, so they're still involved in murder and killing one another. And their sorceries, I mean, sorcery and witchcraft and that is on the increase today. And they hadn't repented of that. Their sexual immorality, rampant, and their thefts. I mean, look at today. I mean, when a person starts a business, he almost needs 50 bathrooms and one that says with a question mark, because you know there's so many designations, you don't know what's going on. I mean, the world is so confused today, and it's just the end result of sin. This, you know, and nobody s sits around and say, well, you know, why are we going through all these problems? They're, like, they're carrying on as if everything is normal at that time in Revelation, and yet that's getting pretty close to the time when Christ returns. So I want to uh, go back here to Revelation 6 because I want to
cover some of the things that are going to happen and some of the conditions. Over in Revelation 6 and verse 8, it says, So I looked, and behold, the pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and not only that, by the beasts of the earth. So there's coming a time when animals are going to be taking their toll on mankind too. Now, it's almost mind-blowing. I mean, we've had disasters in the past where, you know, 100,000 people have been killed with floods and things of that nature. And, and you know, I think there was just under 3,000 during uh, that September 11 attack on those buildings in New York. But one quarter of the current world population of 7.5 billion is 1.8 billion people dead. Not 100,000, not even a million, but almost 2 billion people just from that one event, from the plagues and that. I mean, you could hardly put your mind around the death toll. It's just so great and so large. And over in... Uh, well, Revelation 9, 18, it says, by these plagues, and uh, it says, in Revelation 9, 18, it says, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by fire, smoke, and brimstone, which came out of their mouths. So this is a little later on, and it talks about a third being killed here. So at this time, going by the current population, there would have been probably six billion people left on earth, and now, a third, another third is being uh, killed by these three plagues, which is another two billion. So, I mean, that's almost like four billion people dead. You're getting to the point where half the population is gone. And I mean, you, you, can't, you can't even imagine things like that. When the Bible tells us that our few men left. That's an accurate representation. That's over in Isaiah 24 and verse 6, if you want to turn there. I mean, when we think of some of these scriptures, and you think, oh, well, it, it's, maybe it's an exaggeration, but Isaiah 24 clearly states, I'll just read it here. Isaiah 24 and verse 6, it says, Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate, therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burnt and few men are left. That's, an, that's not an exaggeration, brethren. That's the reality of the situation, all the result of mankind sinning and just turning away from God. Revelation talks about more death, but that does, but doesn't give us the number. Some of the plagues, they just say many men died. What does many mean? We don't know. It just says many men died in the plagues. So one of the first challenges facing us at the beginning of the millennium is, is dealing with all these dead bodies, the burying of the dead, to avoid the spread of disease. Nobody wants to walk around, you know, a bunch of dead, dead bodies and skeletons all over. You know, several years ago in, in the 80s, I went to visit my son, Mark, um, a son, my son-in-law, Mark, who was, at the time, he was at, uh, uh, in Boone, North Carolina, at uh, Appalachian University there. Him and my daughter were taking some courses there. But Boone was named after the, you know, Daniel Boone. The anyway, one day we're, we're driving down to Marion, and Boone is up in the mountains, so there was about, oh, 45 minutes drive down to Marion. It was all downhill. So as we're going along, you know, they had this, they were playing this game. Every time they passed the graveyard, you know, they would, they would say, oh, I see one over here on the left, and I see one over here on the right. And it seems like we never travel more than a couple of miles. It was a graveyard. So when we got to Mary and I, I said to Mark, I says, what is this? I mean, you know, I've, I've driven you know, a lot of places, but I've never seen so many graveyards. And he says, well, he says, this is where they had the Civil War. And they had these battles, and they just buried them there, you know, on the spot. They didn't try to bring them to a central location. And that's why they had all these graveyards there. So I, I want to turn to Ezekiel 39, because uh, it gives us an idea of how long it'll take to bury the, the dead. 
Ezekiel 39 and verse 12, it says, For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. See, that's the purpose behind it. You can't have you know, dead bodies and skeletons all over. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying, and they will gain renown for it is a day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. They shall set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And of course, it, dead bodies, anything dead like that, if you don't deal with it, is a source of disease, which you don't want because, I mean, although it won't affect us as spirit God beings, it will affect those that are alive and living in the millennium. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. And in verse 15, the search party will pass through the land and when anyone sees a man's bones, he shall set up a marker on it till the buriers have buried it, buried it in the valley of uh, Haman Gog. So in this area, the situation where this is going on, they have buriers and they have those that mark the place so that they can uh, cleanse the land. That's going to be a major project when you think of it, you know. And some of us, as you know, leaders and, and uh, kings and priests in the world tomorrow may be involved in that undertaking, organizing this project to cleanse the land. Another area I want to talk about is uh, communication. As members of the God family, how will we communicate with mankind with all the different languages? Well, let's, let's go to Acts. I think Acts gives us a bit of a clue as to what you know, a strong possibility of how that, how God's going to deal with that. Over in Acts 2, and uh, beginning in verse 5, it's Acts 2 beginning at 5, it, it says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So there was a whole group of individuals from all over Europe, and uh, every place under heaven, all over the known world at the time, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not these all who speak Galatians? In other words, it's like saying you go into, uh, there's all kinds of nationalities in a room and, and they hear you speaking in their language. And of course, it's going to be confusing. I mean, where did he learn to speak that, they're going to be saying. I mean, that's just, oh, what's his name? He can only speak English, and yet I hear him in my own language. And how is it that we hear them, each in our own language in which we were born? So they were hearing the apostles speaking in the language, Greek, whatever, German, Italian, whatever language they were. And it says here, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pong Ponctus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So they were from all over these areas, and yet they could hear these apostles who they knew they were unlearned in the sense they weren't scholars, and yet they could hear them in their own language. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our, in our own tongues and wonderful works of God. So they are all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean, eh? If the apostles could be understood by many countries represented there, I think it's quite feasible for us to be able to communicate with people in our own language that we speak, and yet they will hear us in their language. At least, because eventually what will happen, I think in, initially this is one way to overcome the problem, but eventually the solution is found in uh, Z Zephania, the the book of Zephaniah in the uh, third chapter and verse 9 and Zephaniah 3 verse 9 says then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord so eventually we'll all have one language but it doesn't appear that it's going to be initially that way and you can draw that conclusion if you go to Zechariah 8 which was uh, brought up yesterday and it, it struck me when uh, when this because I, I hadn't added this to my notes but it was very interesting when it was read yesterday in Zechariah 
8 In verse 23, it says, In those days the Lord of hosts, thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of the Jewish man, saying, Let us go up with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So this is at the obviously at the beginning of the millennium, and it's every man in their own language. So there's still different languages at that time. But they have heard in their language that those Jews, they, they know where their true God is, so they're going to grab his sleeve and, in other words, take us to Jerusalem. We want to learn this too. But it does say that eventually we'll have one pure language. And, you know, you think about um, what uh, can be accomplished when there's one pure language. Let's go over to Genesis 11. It gives us a bit of a, an idea of, of what men can accomplish when they're... They don't have the impediment of having different languages and breakdown in communication. Over in Genesis 11, in verse 1, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And when you have one language and one speech, you can't have breakdown in communication because what a person tells you is it's clear. I mean, there's so many nuances in, in language, even in the French language, you go to Quebec and you go to France and you go to where, where I learned French in, in uh, British Columbia with a French group. There's little sayings that, you know, if you take them literally, it doesn't make sense. And a lot of languages are like that. And I know when we're in, in, in Germany at the feast there and, and you say things even from English to German, they kind of, sometimes you get a funny look because you, you're bringing out a slogan everybody's familiar with, but they're looking at you and they, they take things more literal. What's going on here? You know, what are you saying to me? And in verse 2 it says, It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So they were localized in this area. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make us bricks, bake them thoroughly. They had bricks uh, for stone, and they had asphalt for mor mortar. Mortar? And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in heavens, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And in verse uh, 5 it says, But the Lord came down to see the city, the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now notice this, it says, Now nothing that they will pur purpose to do will be, beheld, will be withheld from them. In other words, they were going to move along faster than what God had anticipated in his plan. In other words, they could have reached the atomic age, you know, centuries before, you know, mankind did. And, and now this is what uh, God says. He says, come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad for over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, the name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So when mankind spoke one language, they were advancing very, very fast, and God purposely confused the language, and of course men separated into groups where they could understand each other, and then that drove them further away, and it slowed down their progress as far as what they were going to accomplish. And uh, notice in verse 16, it says, And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing will be, nothing that they purpose will be withheld from them. So we're just advancing. Adv they were advancing a little too fast. In the millennium, we will eventually have one language. And think of the advancements that we can have for good and not for greed, you know, it, and, and uh, for money or it, I think it'll really be astonishing when men are not putting their brains to, to develop the fastest rocket to kill the other guy. When they start putting their minds together to uh, improve, you know, the situation and, and mankind and for the good of the earth. I mean, I think it's just going to be absolutely fantastic. And this will be able to advance further when we have one language. Because that way there's no confusion. And no, it's not like... Like the motion picture said, 
you know, a, a breakdown in communication. What we have here is a breakdown in communication, yeah? Well, there won't be no breakdown in communication. Okay, what about pollutions in the, of the oceans? Let's go over to Revelation 8, and uh, I'm going to read verse 8 to 11. It says in Revelation 8 and verse 8, Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third living creature, uh, and a third of the living creatures of the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So it's quite, this event is quite uh, traumatic and dramatic. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So here again we have this many men died, but it doesn't give you the, the actual number. It just means that many died. Now notice a third of the creatures died, and a third of the ships which were which is understandable because it sounds like this is a huge meteorite landing in the ocean which would affect the shores of the continents east and west to them from where the landing and I mean if you think the tsunami in Japan was bad I mean this would be absolutely catastrophic wiping out many cities along the shore with a tidal wave beyond imagination and these things travel something like seven eight hundred miles an hour you know across the water I was watching a, a video that uh, had been made, some person made about the tsunami in Japan. And um, this was taken by an individual. He was, there was a river and there was a bridge over the river and he was standing on the sidewalk and people kept yelling at him you could, because he was recording with this video and they were yelling at him, get out of there, you know, there's a tsunami coming, you know. And, he, and it looked, everything looked normal. I mean, you know, and he was filming away. So all of a sudden, the river started to come up, you know. About a minute later, the, the river rose about a foot. So he thought, well, I better seek higher ground. So he went into a building, and then I don't know how high he was, but, but he was talking, oh, I better get up here, and he was video, videotaping this. When in five minutes, that river was underneath the bridge. That's how high it went, and the, the water came over where he was filling, and there was a big apartment there, and that thing was all full of water within about two or three minutes, up eight feet of water. And I mean, anybody there had about five minutes to get out of there. And a lot of people were running and looking for higher ground. But I mean, that was just a small tsunami. Imagine a meteor the size of a building hitting the oceans, what you'd have. I mean, we can't even imagine that. And of course, a third of the ships were destroyed. You don't destroy a ship with a little ripple. I mean, these are big waves that are flipping ships right over and then they're sinking. And verse 10 sounds like a comet because it breaks up. Comet is mostly ice and it, it breaks up and then it pollutes in, uh, the streams and, and the rivers as opposed to the meteor that lands in the, uh, in the ocean. And many men died because of this. Let's look at what it says later on in Revelation. In Revelation 16, in Revelation 16, and uh, I want to read verses 3 and 4. It says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of dead men, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So the previous event it had a third turning into blood. On this event, everything turns to blood. I mean, Every living thing in the, in the sea dies. I mean, fish can't, you know, breathe in blood. I mean, you know, they call the um, Mars the red planet. I mean, this is going to be the red planet when you have every bit of water, fresh water, oceans, just turn to blood. It's just absolutely, I mean, astonishing, you know. I know at the time of Moses, the Nile turned to blood and the effects that had, but that was only lasting for a few days, but this is to the point where everything dies. Now, how, how is God going to resolve this issue? I mean, the, everything in the ocean is dead, and, and it's just one big blood everywhere around the earth. 
Let's go over to Ezekiel 47. And in spite of all these things, you know, God has a way of resolving this. In Ezekiel 47, and beginning in verse 1, it says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. Now, the temple is going to be facing towards the east, the main front part of it, if you read Ezekiel. And the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. Now, obviously, at this stage, it's not a river. It's, you know, it's, it seems like a small trickle by comparison to what it becomes. And in verse 2, he says, He brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around to the outside, to the outer gate that faces east. So for some reason, he went out the north gate and come around the corner and then facing the east. And he measured 1,000 cubits, which is what? 1,600 feet. And he brought me through the waters and it came up to my ankles. So it was only, what, three inches deep, 1,600 feet away from the wall. Again, he measured 1,000 uh, cubits and brought me through the water and it came up to my knees. So it, 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 in that short distance, it rose quite a bit. Then he measured in another and brought me through and the water came up to my waist. Now this, is, this river is growing exponentially as you, know, as, as you get away from the, from the temple. And in verse five, again, he measured a thousand. It was a river that I could not cross for the water was too deep, which water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. And this is what? Less than a mile from the, from the wall and it was already a river that you couldn't cross and it's going east which is towards the you know Jordan and the Dead Sea he said to me son of man have you seen this then he brought me and returned me back to the bank of the river and in verse 7 when I returned there along the bank of the river w were very many trees on, uh, on one side and on the other then he said to me this water flows towards the eastern region goes down into the valley and enters the sea so it, it goes east, and then, of course, you have the Jordan uh, River going down into the Red Sea. So it goes in that direction. Uh, when it reaches the sea, its it waters are healed, and it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live, and there will be a great multitude of fish because these waters go there. They will be for healing of everything will live wherever the river goes. So there's going to be a total restoration of all the sea animals from this water. Which is, it's living water is, you know, literally, right? But it's also going to clear the water up. You know, the blood, you know, will be gone. Then you'll have clean, pristine water in all the oceans and fish that are not full of mercury and radiation and things of that nature, the way we've polluted the rivers and the things today and it's going to be totally cleaned up it'll just be so refreshing to see a complete restoration of sea animals and fish will and living in crystal clear water i mean we have a, a 4k tv and and I, I like to put it on the sabbath on these programs where they show rivers and streams i mean there's still some areas in the world where they're just so pristine clear and there's just something about it the water flowing you could see how clear it is in the mountains and the snow and it, it's the very millennial like settings but that's what it's going to be like i remember years ago uh, i went with a friend of mine before i was married and we went fishing uh in a place well it was north of a place called harrison hot springs and we were up in the mountain on these logging roads and we were walking for quite a while and i thought man i'm getting thirsty it was a summer day and we come up across a stream, crystal clear water coming down, you know, over the rocks and that. It wasn't very big. And cold, I mean, and this is in the middle of summer, but nice ice cold water. And I just put my mouth in there, had a big drink, and I thought, boy, this is sure refreshing. And I, when I read the, these scriptures, I think that's what it's going to be like. Nice, clear, crystal water coming out of the mountains, you know, with clean, unpolluted fish. As to the ships that were destroyed, and of course by this time there's going to be a lot. Um, well, I, I firmly believe that the technology will be advanced enough if God decides they're going to be cleaned up, they'll be cleaned up. If he chooses for some reason that some can stay there in the bottom of the ocean, because there's a lot of wrecks in the bottom of the ocean today, he'll just leave them. But I mean, I, I know for a fact that if it's going to be polluting the waters obviously it has to be 
taking out of there and dealt with, recycled, I mean, you know, and used for peaceful purposes. I mean, God is not going to clear up the rivers, you know, for, with this water coming from Jerusalem and then have all this, these ships polluted behind them. So the, that's going to be taken care of. The Bible doesn't tell us, but you can, you know, uh, think forward a bit and think, well, with the advancements that we'll make in technology, we'll be able to deal with that issue and then clean up the ocean so that there's no junk and big, you know, miles and miles of plastic bottles floating around. And that'll be all cleaned up. So the oceans will be clean and they'll stay clean. You know, we're going to get into an environment where we're not going to be polluting everything, you know, the earth. Now, what about the cities? For those not destroyed by the wars, this, <coughs> by the wars, this is what's in store for them. Over in uh, Revelation 16, in Revelation 16, and, uh, verse 17, it says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came from the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. This is verse 19. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered uh, before God and gave her to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and a great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, which is around 62 to 100 pounds. We've never seen nothing like that. Men blasphemed God because of the plague uh, of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Now, you think about what it says here, a great earthquake, and all, all the cities of the earth fell. I mean, you know, they just collapsed every city was just going to be a pile of rubble and every island fled away so i mean this earthquake is going to have quite traumatic influence on the topography of the earth and the mountains were not found so the mountains are dropping down islands are moved and every city on the earth is is going to collapse fall into a pile of rubble so our challenge and involvement is going to be quite something over in ezekiel 36 I want to cover a few scriptures and then we'll just sort of talk about it. Over in Ezekiel 36 and verse 10, this is looking towards the solution of this issue. It says, I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. And also in, uh, a little further in Ezekiel 36 and verse 33, it says, Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. And uh, it mentions this again in Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61, it says, and, this, and they shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruins uh, repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. So the indication here is that they're going to rebuild the cities, not just, you know, like bury them and then start over again. You know, we had a, a pastor in the past, he was German, and he, he told us several times that, uh, you know, after the war in Germany, you know, a lot of the cities were destroyed. He said the Germans, they, they rebuilt those cities brick by brick. You know, he emphasized that brick by brick. In other words, they went in there, cleaned up, and rebuilt their cities. Now, if you have a city like New York, I mean, you know, you're not going to do that overnight. If you have to, if you have the responsibility of dealing with that issue, so what are you going to have? Probably, I mean, in my mind, you have a, you know, like four piles. I'm, I'm referring to piles, but areas where you have what's usable. In other words, not everything that collapses is totally destroyed. You have what is usable, what is repairable. Some things are damaged that can be repaired reasonably easy. What's recyclable, because we're not going to have pollution, right? We're going to recycle things. And what's unusable, because, I mean, if you have a garment that's all burnt and torn, what are you going to do? You can't do nothing with it. But, you know, the cities are going to be rebuilt. And it, it's going to be a challenge. And they're not going to be just 
cardboard shacks, you know, or, or tents, I mean, they're going to be rebuilt. I mean, some of you have uh, gone to Germany for the feast. I know Eric has now. And one of the things that was really striking to me, I mean, you go to this town of Templin, I mean, the tallest building there is about three stories high, and then you drive out of town for several kilometers, and there's, you can't see too much because you're in this forest, and all of a sudden, boom, there's this hotel, and you think, what's this doing here? 11 stories high. And one of the things that struck my wife and I, we looked at it and we says, yep, built by the Germans, no question about it. I mean, it's built to last. I mean, you look at that building. They built this hotel to last for a thousand years. I mean, that's one of the structures that was done, you know, during the war or after the war, and that's gonna stand there for a long time. If that building doesn't collapse, I'll tell you, they built that well, well built. So let's have a look at what Moses was instructed. I want to go to Exodus 25. Because there's quite a bit revealed in the Bible about, you know, what God expects of us. And in Exodus 25, um, I want to read verse 8 and 9. Exodus 25, uh, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary. This is God talking to Moses, that I may dwell among them. And he says in verse 9, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the, pat the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So the tabernacle was built according to a, a pattern or a model that God showed Moses. So there was no guesswork involved. And whole, the whole thing had to be built to be transportable. In other words, easily taken down, easily set up when God moved it. But it wasn't, you know, a guesswork how to build it. He showed him a, a model, a plan. I mean, he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, you know, he just wasn't, you know, playing cards with God. God was instructing him. And one of the instructions was how to build a tabernacle, give him a pattern. Everything built according to this pattern. And also in, uh, in Exodus 25 and verse 20, 36, it gives some of the details. Their knobs and their branches shall be one piece. All of it shall be hammered uh, one piece of pure gold. In verse 37, you shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wicker trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. So here, instructions not only in how to build it, but what materials to use, all laid out. And it shall be made of one talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see to it that you make it according to what? According to the pattern which was shown to you in the mountain. So he had specific instructions on how to build his tabernacles and the utensils and the, you know, the table for the showbread and the Ark of the Covenant all laid out and he understood it and he had it in his mind. So there was no guesswork. He knew exactly what to do. And also, the temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> I didn't record <laughs> where this came from, but anyway, I'll just read it to you because I'm not too sure where it came from. It says, all this, said David, I have um, made to understand in writing from the hands of Jehovah, even all the works of this pattern. This is um, instruction to David. Here again, the temple was made according to a pattern. And in the ISV says, all of these things the Lord made clear to me in writing at his direction the construction's plans for all of the building. So the temple in Jerusalem just wasn't haphazardly built. They had a plan, construction, they had a, a plan to go by, like a blueprint. And the King James Version says, all this David said, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. And you can read about the fact that the temple in Jerusalem, I mean, and these are big stones, I mean, you know, 10, 20 tons a piece were all cut and built off-site so that when it was put together, it went together like a puzzle. He says, you never heard a hammer banging. Everything went boop, 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 built, and there it is. And you, you, you couldn't put a knife, I, I read historically, like a razor blade between the stones. That's how precise they were. And yet it was all planned ahead of time by God, given to God. I mean, given to uh, David and Solomon landed up building it, but that, th there was no guesswork. David built the temple according to the pattern and the plans of God. Now, why would not God direct us to build cities according to his plans and patterns, in my mind? I mean, I don't think we'll have 
skyscrapers and cities with slums that are a cesspool of crime, but rather beautiful cities with parks and reflecting the character of God and everything. I mean, some of us have been to Ambassador College. Now that was really, Mr. Armstrong had a, a way of doing things, you know, very classy, but those of us that have been to the college, I mean, the campus was just beautiful. I mean, it was in the middle of Pasadena, in a city, you know, traffic all around, but the grounds itself, you had the auditorium and the, and the, well, the honeycomb buildings and, and the fountains, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. And I, and I keep thinking, you know, that that's kind of like a little bit of an idea, you know, in our minds, how cities will be built in, in the future, you know, with a combination of fountains and, and parks and buildings you know, it, I think it's just going to be a great challenge for us, really an opportunity, to let our light shine in a sense. Over in Amos, uh, chapter 9, how am I doing? Amos 9, I want to read verses uh, 14 and 15. It says, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel, and here again, and they shall build the waste cities and not only build them, but inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall make gardens and eat fruit from them. Gives you a mental picture of the rebuilding of the cities with, you know, vineyards and gardens and fruit. I mean, absolutely gorgeous conditions. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled from it, from the land that I have given them, says the Lord God. So. It's not all going to happen overnight, but in time, the millennium, you know, will, the earth will be, just be a beautiful place. So the millennium presents many challenges, and not only challenges, but opportunities for us as we serve under Christ as kings and priests during that period of time. And today, I have covered a few of the challenges, but there will be many, brethren. For us, our current challenge is to remain faithful so that we can be there to assist in the changes to change the face of the earth, all for the benefit of mankind so that everyone will eventually have an opportunity to become a member of the God family. So let's keep that vision in mind.